let's try to understand what is predictive modeling and go through the predictive modeling life cycle in this module. We have already discussed briefly what is predictive modeling when we discussed common terminologies in the first module of this course. So let's do a small exercise where you would need to identify which of the examples represent predictive modeling. First is recommending movies to a user based on user's attributes like gender, location, age, and past movies watched. Identifying the factors that were responsible for sales reduction of a shampoo product. Viewing websites today's web traffic using Google Analytics. Predicting whether a particular stock will go up, down, or remain same. Before I provide an answer to these questions, let us recap what predictive modeling is. Predictive modeling is making use of past data and trying to predict the future using that past data. Now let us try to answer the questions that I posed during the last slide. Let's start with recommending movies to users according to some of their characteristics. This task can be done in two ways. First, for example, a user has watched a lot of horror movies in the past. So it makes sense to suggest a horror movie in the near future too because that is what he or she may like. Second, for example, people who are very much similar to the user in terms of age, sex, location will prefer classic movies, then it is a good choice to suggest a classic movie like Casablanca to this user. Since both of these methods require analysis of past data and making prediction for the future, this is a predictive modeling task. Let's look at the second option now of identifying the factors behind the sales of a shampoo product. Now since identifying the factors involves analyzing the past data and identifying the factors without having to predict any future sales, this is not a predictive modeling task, but instead a detective analysis task. Similarly, seeing today's web traffic has nothing to do with the past and the future. So this is also not a case of predictive modeling, but is actually just a dashboard. Now coming to our last option, a stock's future price. This is heavily influenced by the past prices as whether the price of stock will go up or down depends on its past performance along with other factors. Also, similar stocks can be analyzed to predict the movement of a particular stock. And since we need to predict the future movement of stock price based on past data along with other type of data, this is actually a predictive modeling task. Now I hope you must have a fair understanding of what can or cannot be called as predictive modeling. So now that we know about different types of predictive models, let us have a look at the different stages of predictive modeling or machine learning. The process of predictive modeling can be divided in six stages. The first step is actually to define the problem you want to solve. This might sound very intuitive, but it gets ignored very frequently as well. So let's start with the first stage, which is problem definition. The first step for a successful model building is to define the right problem. Well, this actually requires multiple steps. The first, identifying the problem and then defining it mathematically. Let us have a look at an example of a bad problem statement. Let's say you want to increase the sales of a company. Why is this bad? Because it lacks any kind of specifications. So what do we do? We ask more questions from all the stakeholders. So do we want to focus on one sales channel, which is the agent distribution channel? Do we want to improve the product portfolio or actually we are looking to improve the agent productivity efficiency? Do we want to focus on new or existing agent productivity efficiency? So let's say the answer for the previous question was we want to look at new agent productivity efficiency. So do we want to look at it for the first three, six or 12 months? So a good problem statement would look something like this. The company wants to increase the productivity of sales agents for the first six months. Once you have defined the problem, you list down all the possible hypotheses which might solve the problem. It is important to make sure that you list down all the possible hypotheses at this stage. So what is hypothesis generation? It is listing down all the possible variables which might influence the problem objective, but care has to be taken that these variables should be free from personal bias and preference since the quality of your model is highly dependent on the quality of your hypothesis. So let's have a look at an example of credit card customers. So what are the factors that impact the default rate of the customer? 
So let us have a look at some of the factors. People with high income are more likely to have low default rate due to their financial stability. Also, the type of job a person has might also affect the default rate since jobs like sales are less stable than data science. So this may lead to high default rate. The credit history of a customer is a good indicator of his default rate since a person who has a bad credit history has a high defaulting. Education also plays a role in the default rate since educated people are more likely to be aware of credit products and they affect the default in payments. Once you have defined the hypothesis, you go ahead and collect the data from various sources. If you have done your hypothesis building well, this part should be a cakewalk. You already know what you're looking for. You should try and collect data from as many sources as possible to either prove or disprove your hypothesis. Also, when you look at the data, you might come across a few more hypotheses which can improve your model. So you make sure you capture them in the list of your hypothesis. For the discussed example, we can collect data from various sources, namely demographics of the customers, transaction history, payment history of the customers, the credit score as provided by the credit bureau, or the competition pricing. So each of these could be your source of your data to either prove or disprove one of your hypotheses. So this was all about data extraction and collection. So next very important step which we will discuss in great detail in the upcoming modules is data exploration and transformation. This stage includes understanding the data, testing the hypothesis we created during the hypothesis generation step, and finally transform appropriately to use an algorithm. It involves variable identification where we try to identify what are the types of variables present, then univariate analysis taking one variable at a time, bivariate analysis where we take a combination of variables and see what is the relationship, missing value treatment, outlier treatment, and finally looking at variable transformations in order to get the data set ready to be used for a machine learning algorithm. Once we have defined the business problem, created a list of hypotheses, collected the data and performed exploratory analysis along with the required transformations to the data, we go to the predictive modeling stage. Predictive modeling is used in several organizations at a large scale. Political parties use this technique to know their chances of winning on micro geographic areas. Walmart and Tesco predict the next purchase of their customer and whatnot, and be it sports, stocks, whether real estate, predictive modeling is used everywhere. Now that you know the immense importance of what you're going to learn in this video, let's start. As mentioned before, a predictive model is used to predict future behavior or results based on past data and trends. Let's look at an example to understand it better. So let's say a retail bank wants to predict the probability or chances of default for its credit card customers. Here we need to predict probability. And as you would expect, probability will lie between 0 and 1. Assuming that 10% of customers will default in next 3 months, and let's say this is based on historic data, what do you think would be the probability of default of a customer? You would have probably guessed it right. It is 0.1. So if you randomly pick a customer, the chances of him defaulting over a period of next 3 months is 0.1. But will this generalization be sufficient for making business decisions? Of course not. Business owners, managers always appreciate close to accurate models rather than generic ones. So how would a predictive model help in this case? A predictive model will shift the probability towards one of these extremes and give more accurate probability based on given attributes of the customer such as age, income, savings of a customer and so on. This predicted value could be closer to 1 or closer to 0. This is a simple picture of how a predictive model works. As the predicted value could become closer to 1 which means the customer has a higher likelihood of default or it can become closer to 0 which means the customer has lower chance of default. This is a very simple picture of how predictive model works. As we proceed, I'll introduce you to more complex forms. For now, let us look at steps involved in predictive modeling. Predictive modeling consists of three steps. First is algorithm selection. Second is training your model. And finally, you make predictions. So let's understand each of them in detail. So let's look at the steps involved in the algorithm selection. 
This would be simple if you remember the data exploration stage. A dependent variable is what we measure in a model. The name itself says these variables are dependent on independent variables. And independent variables are those which we use to measure or predict the dependent variable. So algorithms in predictive modeling can be broadly classified in two types. Supervised learning algorithms and unsupervised learning algorithms. Presence or absence of dependent variable mainly decides the choice of algorithm. Therefore, if we have dependent variable, we can use supervised learning algorithms. If we don't have a dependent variable, we will use unsupervised learning algorithm. For example, if you want to predict whether a customer would default or not, it will be using a supervised learning algorithm. Why? Because you want to predict a dependent variable based on independent variables. On the other hand, if your organization wants to segment its customer so that this segmentation can be used across various engagements, you would be using unsupervised learning algorithms. Each of these methods can contain several algorithms. For example, if the dependent variable is present and is of continuous nature, we'll use regression. However, if it is categorical, we'll use classification algorithms like logistic regression or tree-based model. Also, if the dependent variable is not present at all, we will use unsupervised learning methods such as clustering. I'm sure many of you would be wondering, without dependent variables, can predictive modeling still help? The answer is yes. Actually, predictive modeling is done for two things, prediction and inference. Unsupervised learning helps us in deriving inference. For example, a company which wants to segment its customer into unique groups as to plan a product placement. In this case, the company doesn't want to predict anything but infer which customers are similar based on their past purchases. So that can be clustered in a unique group. Let's move on to the next step. Now that we have selected an algorithm, we need to train the model. Model training is simply the process where model learns the relationships or correlations or associations between independent and dependent variables. Let's look at the training phase now. This is a simple model built using linear regression and one independent variable. The independent variable here is age. The model predicts the credit limit as a function of age. Hence, you can see as age increases, the credit limit typically increases. In other words, we can say credit limit is positively correlated with age. The equation represents the predicted model. You can also see the linear equation that fits the data provided. It is given by 1.4904 into age minus 16.838. Note that this is just one of the ways the credit limit can be predicted. You can use several other algorithms like tree-based algorithms to come up with a different result. But the question is, where do we use this equation? We use this equation to predict the dependent variable in the data set. In this equation, we simply need to pass the value of age from test data to obtain the value of the credit limit. Wait, but what is test data set? Did this question come to your mind? It's good if it did, because it's the first time I've used this term. So let's understand it. The data set which we use for predictive modeling is divided into two parts. First is the trained data and the second is the test data. As their name reveals, the trained data is actually used to train the model and this consists of outcomes which are known to you. And this data is used to train the model. On the other hand, the test data does not contain value of the dependent variable and this is used to make predictions in future and score our predictions. So let's say you have selected an algorithm and trained your model. The next question is, how will you use this model to make predictions in the future? And this is the last stage of predictive modeling. Coming back to this example, let's predict the value. We have this equation and we also know that we should substitute the age value in the equation to get the predicted value. So let's predict the credit limit for age 40 and 50. So for age 40, when you substitute the value of age equal to 40, you get the credit limit equal to 42.778. On the other hand, when you substitute the value 50, you get 57.682. As you can see, the model has predicted the credit limit for age 50, which is higher than the credit limit for age 40. This brings us to the close of predictive modeling. 
Coming back to the overall process, we now come to the next and final step which is model deployment or implementation. Once the model is created and the predictions are done, the next step is to implement the model in the real world and create a product. So let's look at some examples. Predictive models such as recommendation engines are being used heavily by e-commerce companies. Face detection feature in your mobile phone is an implementation of predictive modeling. Even better example, the antivirus which we use in our desktops, laptops and mobile phones uses ML algorithms to detect malicious software. 